Welcome to the Friendly Aussie Podcast. Hello, 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 everybody. We are here with Michael Berkman. This is the Friendly Aussie Podcast. And Michael is the Greens member for Maywa in Brisbane. So this conversation will be uh, quite political. Strap yourselves in. Um, we're going to be talking about, you know, some of the recent news that's happening, the elections coming up in Queensland, and uh, anything else that might cross our mind. So how you doing, Michael? I'm good. Yeah, good to be with you. Yeah, good to be with you too. Thanks for having us. Yeah. Also got Yossip in the studio with us. <laughs> Didn't really mention that. Um, you know, I'm just going to get straight into it because I'm really, I'm really excited to be here and I think this is an awesome opportunity to have a dialogue with someone who is in our, in our halls of parliament. Yeah. Um, one of the biggest stories that kind of has hit our, our airways recently has been uh, the Palaszczuk government kind of rejecting the broader findings of the Queensland Productivity Commission in their like 500 and something page report. Mm. Yeah. Um, there were some things that they took on in terms of criminal justice reform, mm. um, and those are good changes. Yeah. Um, but p- particularly when it came to a lot of the, the recommendations uh, around decriminalization, cannabis and, and broader drug decriminalization, it just really um, was rejected and not seen as an, an important issue. Mm. Um, I guess what I want to know is, uh, what do you think about the comments that have been made by the Labor government? And, and what do we do about an incumbent government that just doesn't seem to care about these issues, despite the fact that it impacts a lot of people? Mm, yeah. Look, it's... I mean, I, I guess to start with, I was genuinely impressed by that report. You know, it's almost unusual to see, um, you know, a, a, such a, a heavily embedded institution, government, you know, government body like QPC come out with such strong recommendations mm. so you know they've, they've got to be applauded for having you know done the work they did looked at the evidence and, and presented it to you know to the government in such frank terms um, it should have been bigger news than it was as far totally. as I'm concerned but it, it, it's a big it was report. yeah it's an enormous report and it covers so much territory yeah um, so how much did it cost to get done ah no it was, idea it um, was a lot of money wasn't yeah it? yeah no doubt um, but you know, it should have it should have garnered a lot more interest um, mm. and attention than it did. But yeah, I guess the 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 response from both the government and the opposition, um, well, the opposition's response is incredibly predictable. Um, but it's disappointing, I think, that the government's um, just bought in so completely to the tough on crime rhetoric that the LNP pushes, and that um, and that prevents them from taking, you know, well uh, well grounded evidence based mm. steps. That are just a little that involve a bit of political courage. Don't you think yeah. it's pretty funny because you see that parallel in many other issues: the incumbent Labor government or the majority centre-left party mm. um, has an opportunity because they are in government mm. to make important changes. But because of what they feel is electoral pressure mm. um, coming from the Murdoch press and other places, yeah, um, it's it's like they do back down, and that's happened on climate change and Adani and a, and a variety of other issues as well. Yeah, like, yeah, yeah. as a trend, like, you're the Greens party, you're the, the kind of um, populist left party flanking the Labour party. So how how do we, um, as Greens voters, as progressive voters, deal with that situation where it seems like the majority representation mm. that's closest to us isn't really engaging yeah. Doesn't need to engage. Well, I think kind of recognising that, frankly, is the first step, you know. It's, mm. it's like, you know, part of the program or something like that. Just a- acknowledging that politics is inherently conservative in some ways. Yeah, right. Um, I, think, I think it sits, um, you know, well behind the kind of leading edge of, of where, you know, social progress is taking us and kind of inevitably taking us. Yeah. Um, but what, I mean, what we do as participants in democracy is, is actually the real the life mm. question. Um, so recognising that as the starting point that, you know, politics, we, we quite literally have to drag politics to, you know, the future that we're headed towards. Right. And Greens um, might have the, the hardest job at that because really they are presenting a transformative agenda in some ways. Yeah. Things that need to be changed. Yeah, um, that's right. And in politics, it's easier to keep things as they are. Yeah. And just be a kind of Machiavellian type. That's right, yeah. Look, retention of power is kind of at the core of so much of what we see going on in, in the big parties. I mean, that's, they've, they've kind of 
you know, that's the business model, right? Mm, yeah. um, Their sort of values. Yeah, yeah. So I think, um, you know, progressive voters and participants in, you know, progressive politics, I guess, need to... Um, need to recognise that it's a, it's actually not so much about changing um, changing the minds of politicians because mm. institutional politics doesn't so much allow that to yeah, play out. Yeah, agree. It's about creating the social conditions for change and, uh-huh. and just making it imperative. You know, we uh, and I think this is where a, a report like the Productivity Commission's report and the government response is not just disappointing; it's actually surprising. Yeah, the stats in yeah. there demonstrate that there is such broad popular support for for decriminalisation. Agreed. You know, I was not... I, I don't know that I'd seen numbers quite that high before. You know, around 80% of people in favour of, of decrim um, for cannabis, more than 50 for MDMA. Which is incredible. Approaching 50 for, for heroin. Even. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it demonstrates that there is really this broad recognition that, that a criminal approach to drugs is not work. working. Yeah. And that we need to do something differently. But I suppose... You know why? Why a government would choose not to act on that is anyone's guess, and I, mm. I suppose they've, you know, somehow internally done the maths that the electoral risk, you know, the scope for a culture war that will do them damage electorally, yep. is greater than the potential for, you know, movement on this issue to to, to turn votes. Their I way. can remember the day that the federal Greens kind of announced to the world that they were going to decriminalise all drugs if they had anything to do with it, mm. and. Yeah. There was this big headliner in, I think it was um, the Korea Mail, mm. and it was just Richard Di Natale and oh, they're like smoking crack. Yeah, yeah. Like yeah. the idea being that they were somehow, you know, going to get people addicted to meth. Yeah. Um, yeah. Look, it's 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 so frustrating to look at a. I mean, to respond. My response to a report like Kippy says, report the other week is that it's exciting and that will be turned immediately by conservative media to to oh look this you know old mate druggy politicians excited about getting his hands on some drugs and yeah it's just so it's such a it's such an easy um you know sort of bait and switch for them to play but the reality is we should be excited about this as a as an important part of the evidence base for change um, mm. but yeah it's like there's no there's no avoiding that and in a sense like that by that i mean the you know the response from um, from Murdoch Media, but mm. you know, if if photoshopping a crack pipe into Richard De Natale's hand is the worst they can come up with, then okay, keep keep going. I know? guess that's what they have at the end of the day. Yeah, yeah. The, um, the Natale mural where he's like hitting a bong and it's got like a lot of like <laughs> Australiana stuff around it. It's probably one of my favourite art pieces like I've ever seen. I don't know <laughs> if I've seen that one. I wonder. I don't know. That's when they never. released the uh, Just Legalize It. Yeah, yeah. Um, they, some graffiti artist put up like a massive mural. Like, oh, I did like, see that. three by three metres or something. Yeah. It's just, it, it was basically like Bob Marley in the background, just a classic. And I'm just like, oh yeah, I like that, yeah. Yeah, I've, I've not heard Richard's take on it, but um, <laughs> yes, <laughs> interested yeah. to see it. Mm. Uh, personally, like what, what is your take on it? Have you ever experimented with any kind of recreational substances. Yeah, yeah. Look, I'm I'm no stranger to drugs, and my my personal views align completely with um, you know the evidence based policy position that the party's got. Cool. Um, I guess my you know I've I've been relatively open about this as well. Though. My my personal experience also kind of touches directly on all of the risks associated with drugs. You know, mm. I've I've had you know, direct experience with friends and loved ones who've struggled with addiction and who haven't had the support services yeah. available to them when they need it, um, you know, because I guess this is this is the part of the conversation that um, is actually driving the need for policy shift, but it's not it's not being had out in the open. Absolutely. Um, yeah. It's not the discussion. Yeah, we, you know, and, and this is the really pernicious consequence of that reactive, mm. um, you know, hypersensitive and, and kind of, um, I don't know, just the, the absurd kind of reefer madness media response yeah. is that it, it, it puts all of the real harms and the necessary responses out of the frame. Dehumanises them, really. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So I, I think, you know, uh, there's no doubt there are amazing people who are working hard in this space and who have been for, you know, since time immemorial, mm. trying to trying to shift the conversation, create space for the policy change, but also just doing the hard work on the ground, providing people with 
you know, the drug and alcohol support services. Yep. And that's, you know, that's what, that's, that's where we really miss out by continuing to have this stupid focus on, on criminalisation and, you know, um, yeah, it's all, it's all just political chest beating and the consequence is that real people face more harm and miss out on the medical support they need to deal with what is undeniably a medical concern for, mm. you know, for government and society. Yeah, so. yeah too true. Mm. I think, um, well, one of the main things that, that kind of gets me interested about uh, the, the Greens broader evidence based kind of po- uh, policy approach to, to drugs and to cannabis is just the way that, um, particularly with cannabis and the idea of a cannabis agency, I think that allows for many different possibilities when it comes to inserting those support services, mm. um, allowing people to basically make um, decisions feeling like they have a, a little bit of confidence in themselves um, and that they aren't alone. Mm. Um, I feel like a lot of people do turn to drugs because of a variety of mental health issues. So mm. being able to um, you know, give people those things is really important. Um, and also to provide a product that's uh, highly regulated in certain ways to mm. ensure that you know, people aren't getting hurt. Mm. Um, yeah. And that that can't be used against a kind of broader legalization as well in mm. one way. Yeah. Um, but I, I kind of want to talk about the specifics of what might be the Australian Cannabis Agency, mm. assuming that the Greens policy approach kind of follows through. Yeah. Um, how do you feel about it and how do you see it? Because are there any differences between what has been uh, introduced at the federal level with the private members bill? Mm. And, and how you would like to see it implemented on the state level. Yeah. And um, one of the main things I just kind of want to prod about with this is just how do we, um, how do we kind of make everybody happy? I know that's impossible, but <laughs> there's this situation right now where a lot of people are going to be highly resistant to the idea that with legalization we should get the government involved in a variety of ways. Mm. Um, I'm not necessarily on that side of the political spectrum and I don't really worry about those things, but I know it's a concern. Mm. Um, And that people are are going to be concerned about how things are indeed um, regulated by the government, how many plants they'll be able to keep in their Mm. home, Mm. um, under what conditions, et cetera, and what the market is gonna look like. And the balance can just, it can get, a lot of people have tried different balances across the world in these experimental legal marketplaces Mm. um like in california you basically have a gray market and it doesn't matter they just put anything on there Mm. and if you get hurt it's your fault Mm. um in colorado and other places they have a different approach yeah so i don't know a lot in that question i know Um, i I couldn't i couldn't yeah (laughs) sorry no uh, look i think um Look, what the what what an agency ultimately looks like is um, is a tough question to answer, I suppose, because it very much depends. Like an essential part of its function is to you know coordinate um, activities that largely fall within state jurisdiction. Mm-hmm. Um, but there's a necessary you know oversight role and coordination at the federal level that I think it would have to play. Um, uh, the the question of you know essentially too much government interference. Look, I, I, don't, uh, I don't myself see that as a risk. That's the entire purpose of this process is, yeah, to, right. is, to, get, um, you know, is to get government in this space and to provide that kind of quality control at the same time provide, ensure that whatever revenue comes from a legalisation framework is actually going back into the support services mm. that, yeah. um, that are needed and that kind of justify it in the first place in, in many people's minds. Um, so I, I guess the, you know, the, the, the feature of the plan that we've put out that I, I think is a, an important kind of, you know, the, the counterbalance to that over-regulation concern is, sure. is that capacity to grow, you know, to home grow. Right. Yeah. Um, and I don't think, I mean, people might have different views on this, but I think it's hard to make the case that 
you know, six plants for personal use isn't enough if you want to remain outside of a regulated government market. I definitely yeah. agree. Yeah. Um, so, but also I think that there's there's some concern that if any bill were to be introduced into Parliament, it would be that that plant limit would be watered down from six to maybe two or one. Mm. Um, See, the thing for me about the plant limit is it's actually preposterous and ridiculous because do you know how big a plant can get? Mm. Yeah. Right? Like you can make a tree out of one plant. So yeah. mm. what defines a plant? Mm. Right? And then if you want to go into weight, well, you don't really know the weight till it's complete. Mm. <laughs> like you don't know what you're exactly going to yield out of it. And to me, the number of plants is really irrelevant. Um, I think the bigger thing is just allowing the home grow or not. Because you will see um, some people, the corporate space will not want people to home grow. Mm -hmm. They want to have those profits for themselves. Yeah. But you've got people who will home grow who are doing it now. Mm -hmm. um, and it, it's how much of a black market will that create? Um, will it continue? And all of that. And that's where I see the issue. Because like right now in Canada, you have about a $7 billion cannabis market, but only about a billion of that is in the um, legal market. Mm. So you've got $6 billion apparently where it's in the black market and why have people not made the jump? Is it a quality thing? Is it the fact that everyone's already been growing and it's it's just a way of life? It's like no, it's been normalized there for mm. many, many years. Yeah. So that's or where I start Cost to... incentives or what, yeah, what yeah. is it? I mean, it's hard to gauge. And I guess looking at, looking at the role of an agency, the best, you know, the best we've got at this point, I suppose, is to, you know, look at other analogous jurisdictions and mm. try and kind of filter that experience through our particular, you know, political legal structures here. For me, the agency should only be focused about looking at the chemicals that are being used in the plants. So, like, just checking, um, so anyone who's growing on a commercial level, having a look, are they using plant growth regulators, which I'll get into in a little bit, because mm. um, that's a part of our big campaign. Um, Maybe labels as well with THC content. THC CBD. labels, like uh, ensuring like people know what they're getting. And it's not just THC. A lot of people think of uh, cannabis as either THC and CBD, but there's mm. so many other compounds like CBN, CBD, well, I just said CBD, but uh, the C CDC, there's just CBN. Um, there's a lot of different compounds and they all provide different effects for different people. Um, and then I think it's really about educating the public on actually what cannabis does with certain compounds mm. um, and also what certain terpenes, which is the smell of cannabis, does for people in terms of a relax relaxation effect, um, maybe an anti-stress effect, um, anti-anxiety, these mm. sorts of things. It's actually educating what this type of cannabis does because cannabis is not one plant. It's mm. thousands and thousands of varieties that people have been crossbreeding and have created just miraculous things um, that can help with so many different medical problems um, for the individual. But mm. the thing is, a lot of people, especially in Australia, just have no knowledge of that. Yeah. Because here, whole black markets. Just... Our black market is hydro bush, mm. and the black market has slowly started to shift to actually identify these strains. But because it's a black market, you don't actually know if that's the reality of mm. what you're getting. You know, it's mm. plant matter. So well, look, this is one of the many, many downsides of you know decades of criminalization is that you know those intricacies around the the composition of mm -hmm. different you know different types of cannabis the the effects of different compounds on people the you know even you know even questions like when we look at issues which are current you know very real issues now and gaps in regulation around um you know drug driving and mm. the you know the balance between um, presence and impairment. Or, yeah, you know, yeah. like we, we just haven't got the research on on all of these. You know, the basic cause and effects of yeah. you know of um, cannabis and our physiology. So, uh, you know, if we if we had seen research ongoing yeah. over yeah. however many decades and now, development since, too. Yeah. Yeah, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's right. Um, For me, when I'm like at home, and I I only vaporize. I'm a vaporizing guy. It's like how you monitor a lot, manage a lot of health concerns, you know, you're not getting your carcinogens and all of that coming in, mm -hmm. but, you know, I'm literally just packing a little bit of dried herb into a glass tube, and it's like a straw, and I'm just inhaling it, and I'm like, isn't this strange that this is illegal? Mm. It's literally just a grass, like, it looks like oregano, you know, and it's just being pushed mm. in, and, like, I could go to prison for this in, a, in, in some sense, mm. and I found that just, every time that happens, it's just a really big mind boggle of 
this could literally be thrown out on the grass and you wouldn't know. I feel like in some ways, um, I mean, this this might not ring true to, to you or, or whatever, but there's a feeling that a lot of this prohibition stuff has a more sinister or underlying um, function, which mm. is to kind of like drill it into people to remain complicit and mm. to narrow their horizons and their possibilities in life. And I think that's the same reason why psychedelics are basically made illegal and mm. why that stuff isn't available to the public. Um, well, and that's coming up against some interesting kind of headwinds in the, in the, you know, the research that was previously done and, is, and as I understand it, is emerging again around mm. the, the potential therapeutic value of, of a variety of illicit Trouble. drugs. Really. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, it's, you know, it, it's kind of, in some ways, um, you know, it's naive to pretend that there aren't risks involved and potential harms, but it's equally naive to pretend that there isn't very, you know, very real therapeutic potential in, yeah. you know, in some of these, some For of these me, substances. it's a big weird thing that cannabis is being used throughout human history, like all of human history, and then it suddenly just became illegal less than a hundred years ago, and mm. it's just... Um, our bodies have adapted to using cannabis like mm. we have an endocannabinoid system our body re responds really really well to it um, breast milk has cannabinoids in it so are we going to make breast milk illegal <laughs> um, so like it's these kinds of things that it's like it doesn't make a lot of sense for me and a lot of people um, when it has existed for literally millennia mm. um, and then the question becomes like look at how powerful um, implement, implementation of policy can be um, on that level, just on an ideological level. If something is made illegal, then it's very much like taboo and over there, like you don't deal with it. Mm. And it's become like that. Mm. Um, how do you, like, I guess this is one of the biggest things, because you seem to be one of the only members of parliament in Queensland who's really taking on this issue. Mm. Um, what's the best approach in a place like Queensland or in a place like Australia? You see New Zealand doing the referendum, mm. direct vote. Yeah. Um, is that kind of thing even possible with our constitution and with our set of rules? And yeah. further, is a private member's bill all we can really try in Parliament? Or uh, look, I guess the the the, the short answer is um, is yes. Like private members' legislation is one of the very few levers that's available in in our unicameral Parliament in Queensland to to actually put an issue in front of Parliament and to you know to. You know, it's difficult to even say that you can make Parliament consider an issue through a private member's bill because right. I've, you know, I've introduced three so far this term. One of them is currently back on the notice paper for debate. The other two, it's almost, it's very, very unlikely that we'll get that far through the list of private members ledged to actually have a debate. Yeah, yeah. So they, they step through the committee process and, um, you know, you could you could get that level of consideration um, on any given issue through private members legislation, but um, but it's a very limited um, scope of parliamentary steps that I can take compared with, you know, a, 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 a system like New Zealand where they've not only got, um, you know, much more, um, you know, they've got meaningful proportion of representation there, yeah. which kind of drives a, a, a more inevitable power sharing arrangement. And I think that's, that's given the the kind of ongoing decline in um, in support for the major parties. I think that's ultimately where we're headed in Queensland. So yeah. there's the scope for you know the the absence of an upper house and the kind of checks and balances that come with that. Um, I, I broadly see it as a negative. <laughs> like it's it, it means less accountability um, for our legislators. For um, sure. But if this decline for the major parties, uh, support for major parties continues, then we do find ourselves in a position where, um, you know, where minority government is much more the norm, where power sharing becomes something that that any government of the day just has to come to terms with. Yeah, um, right. And I think that that ultimately promotes and kind of requires a more um, a more nuanced, more sophisticated and um, a more kind of just grown-up politics. I think that's very true. And, yeah. you know, as much as people like to say, oh, come government's parties shouldn't uh, govern in minority or, mm. or with uh, another party. Um, you do see, like in New Zealand all of the times, that this issue in particular has been tabled mm. on a federal level in New Zealand. It's been because the Greens and Labour have joined together mm. and joined forces. Mm. It's that ability to cross-communicate and actually create change. Yeah. 
And I think that that isn't impossible in Australia. It's just not necessarily as visible. It hasn't mm. been made tangible. Yeah, electoral reform is like the unsexiest topic in the world. It's it is impossible like... to get people to really, you know, people at large to really focus on it and consider the <laughs> you know, pros and cons of different systems. But, you know, something like a, a you know, mixed member proportionate system. Oh, I'd love that. System. Yeah. Like, I'd like just parties to be dissolved. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, they're not mentioned anywhere in the Constitution, are they? It's um, true. It's an it's true. odd, uh, just a kind of byproduct of the way political power has been. Mm. Um, you know, being distributed after the, you know, the jostle within that constitutional framework, right? Mm. So, mm. Do you think cannabis is a state issue or a federal issue? Uh, look, it's, I mean, it's both. It's, it, I mean, it certainly can. What happens, both. like we've had the ACT legalised, but that's kind of a bit of a joke. They've almost already had the same laws that just came into effect forever, mm. um, where you were able to have a plan and it was decriminalised. I think the only difference is now you won't get a fine if you're caught with plants, mm. um, with a uh, flower on your person. Mm. But <clears throat> you always have the federal government saying it's a state issue. Then you respond to a state MP and they'll tell you it's a federal issue because it goes against the constitution. And mm. it's just like, well, I, rock hard place. What do I you do? You could that? also argue that it's an international issue, considering that you've yeah. got the UN treaties. Stuff like so that. that's, I mean, that's one of the elements of the issue that puts it um, squarely, at least to some extent, in, you know, in federal hands. Um, I mean, the fact that we're talking about potentially creating a regulated scheme that deals with, you know, the, you know in which corporations would be the primary vehicle, and mm. that makes it a federal power too, but at a, at a sort of more fundamental level, all the criminal justice issues um, that that kind of flow from decriminalisation or legalisation are, are absolutely state concerns. So, so there's no. The, I don't think you can sensibly say it's it's one or it's the one other. Or the other. Um, that might be the problem with you know trying to yeah. pass the buck over. You know. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. See, one thing I'd like to talk about that I think probably no politicians really know about with cannabis that happens in the black market is uh, PGRs, plant growth regulators. Mm. So a lot of what criminal organisations are doing is they're pumping um, cannabis with basically something to make them grow quicker and faster and bigger. Not hydroponics, it's in a hydroponic setup, but it could be done outdoor as well. But these chemicals basically just make bigger fruits. But the thing is, these chemicals are proven to be carcinogenic. They're proven to be very toxic for people. And they're everywhere in Brisbane. And they're everywhere in all of Australia. Not just Brisbane, everywhere in Australia. Particularly the regional areas. Right, right. yeah. So what happens when people smoke this cannabis, they actually form a much bigger addiction because you actually have to smoke a lot more to get the same high. But then the high gives people headaches, makes people throw up, and it shows all the negative problems with cannabis. But the thing is, that isn't cannabis. It's, it's, it's not actually... Um, how it should be grown and all of that and this is where the regulation would help big time but this is the health issue that we have and it's not being talked about at all by mm. anyone mm. and I think that's something that's a real shame because this this is the reason why a legal framework would be pop, uh, would make a lot of sense is this is actually what's happening it's not about lacing cannabis people are like oh they laced it with ice or MDMA or whatever that doesn't happen that like whoever thinks that happens is insane why would a drug dealer want to give you free drugs <laughs> like it doesn't make sense like however increasing your yields with this paclobutrazole stuff that's something that a drug dealer is interested in because they can make a lot of money out it's not it. actually the drug dealer too it's it's the drug dealers like you know maybe on the fifth level of it it's yeah, the it's growers true. and the people who are organizing the actual um, operation it's it's on a much higher level but the only reason this is happening is because of economics essentially because people want to make a buck and there's no sense of ethics around handing this stuff out to people or at least there's a lack of it because you know until Yosef and I actually started this publication there wasn't um, much info there was a reddit thread and that was it we've um, made an article about how to identify PGR if you look up PGR weed we're number one in Google even if you look up PGR we're like rank three it's kind of ridiculous mm. but we've now started a campaign called fuck PGR and uh, we were at the Hemp Expo last year in October and we handed out uh, two and a half thousand of these stickers and uh, let me tell you, people know about fuck PGR now. Like mm. they're all over Brisbane and even the country. Like we we send them out now as well, and we're trying to build this big, big movement about it. And we've pretty much wrote a guide on how to identify it. 
Mm. And the thing is, um, I had the Queensland Health Department come up to us at the uh, Hemp Expo, mm -hmm. um, checking if we're selling anything smoking related because we're in Queensland, we can't sell anything of that sort in a pop-up stand or even generally in a normal store. Mm. We basically didn't. We had a herbal grinder and we had a carbon filter that absorbs smoke and stops the smell. But they made me take down my shirts, which was a picture of a cannabis bud punching out a Marlboro packet. That was apparently promoting smoking. I thought it was doing the opposite, but mm. that's just me. But I asked them, do they know about PGRs? Because I was handing out thousands of flyers that day, and they had no idea. Mm. And they work for the health department. So how can you work for the health department and not know actually what's going on with the health? of people using cannabis. Yeah. And that's another thing, like the the kind of cannabis culture, the cannabis community in Queensland, by design, is separated from and isolated from the bureaucratic structures, the support structures, um, the rest of mainstream society, because it's a countercultural movement. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, as you say, by design. Yeah. Um, yeah, and, and look... I mean, all of the all of the issues you just raised are, are issues that can be dealt with within a regulated right, system. Right. I mean, we you know the you know the inevitable drive for black markets to just maximise profits, like you know every other markets, and do it in a way that without any regulation creates unnecessary health risks to people. Um, that's you know that's the most obvious outcome. There's there's a, there's a certain inevitability about that if government's not prepared to step up and regulate and. And it's a huge market, you know. Yeah, it was yeah. Something like, again, I'm struggling to remember numbers from the QPC report, but four and a half odd billion dollars that could be taken out of the black market if, uh, if the government was to regulate and legalise mm -hmm. cannabis and MDMA. That's I mean, huge. that's it's sure, an enormous MDMA is probably amount of money. A lot more. Mm. Like, MDMA is really interesting for me because. In 2015, the regular street price was about two two hundred and fifty dollars a gram. Now, in 2020, it's, it's less than a hundred dollars a gram. It's become candy, mm. and there's no regulation there. It, the price is going down and down and down because there is such a more supply. Like no one, <laughs> if they're wondering why we have um, aggressive problems in the valley and whatnot, it's literally all because alcohol has gotten way too expensive, mm. right? We like what's it cost me for like a pint now? More than eleven dollars normally. If I go, it's yeah. like thirteen dollars. So alcohol's gotten expensive, but pills, oh, they're cheap. Mm. They're cheap. I can buy two pills for less than fifty dollars, mm -hmm. like much less than fifty dollars, and I'm good for the whole night. Versus if I want to drink for the whole night, I'd probably spend two to three hundred dollars for like a good good night of drinking. So yeah, why and that people drugs, drugs? You know, other dangerous behaviors too, like the you know the phenomenon of preloading and yeah, the rest. exactly. It's, you know. But um, if you're wondering why there's more, it's because the prices have gone up. It's mm. not, it's not much else other than um, people are feeling the pinch. Mm. And I think as well, you know, the, the, the sense I have of you know, you know, a bit too old to go into the valley much anymore, mm. Um, mm. without well, feeling well, incredibly no. awkward. But uh, <laughs> but it's you know, it it feels to me anytime I've been in there recently that there isn't, um, there isn't much of the same kind of incentive as in like the the, the music industry the mm -hmm. support of you know for live music venues and and the rest isn't isn't maybe what it was well oh, as i remember sort music, of, right. the mu so i've been in the music scene for a while now like that's my main hobby is going to gigs yeah it's actually growing in brisbane brisbane yeah, actually has cool. probably one of the best music scenes in australia now. yeah it's because yeah. it's a small knit community and the bands help each other and mm. they have nice scenes nice it's, it's, it's a yeah, really okay. good scene that's happened but you'll see very few people are drinking yeah, most people yeah, are right. MDMA, and they're actually pleasant to deal with. It's not mm. quite happy times. You rarely ever have issues. The issues that you get normally are people who are drinking, who are really, really heavy, heavily drinking, and they've often mixed with like Red Bulls and things like that. Why is there no regulation on selling drinks that are um, mixed with like uh, energy drinks? Mm. You're combining sugar, caffeine, and alcohol, which has sugar. Uh, and giving it to people, and mm. then you're wondering why they're getting aggressive. Mm. Then why aren't you regulating that? Like, that's what I kind of get into. Well, yeah, some of the inconsistencies in terms of um, excise stuff as well, like the amount of tax that goes on to alcohol and tobacco versus illicit drugs. Um, unsurprisingly, some people will go for the cheaper and illicit option mm. um, that is also more dangerous. Mm. Or potentially more <laughs> potentially. dangerous. Um, yeah. But yeah, I don't know. It's it's interesting to, to bring that up. I, mm. 
I guess I want to talk about like because we've kind of just been circling around the idea of decriminalization of drugs generally. Mm. Um, how do you think like special interests? How do you think capital and like the broader systemic forces? How do they play into that picture of just having this kind of stagnant um, context where we don't really have any way to there's there doesn't seem to be any obvious way to make transformative change in this area mm. and so there's some kind of roadblock and why is that in place I guess yeah. that's what I'm asking um, yeah look, I don't I, I think I mean this is a question that applies equally to all areas of social policy mm. you know, what's what's preventing um, a shift towards a you know a sound evidence based position uh, and I think um, I think political inertia is kind of a hard thing to to adequately describe or mm. or um, it would describe to start with let alone actually address but I think we, we started touching on this before that actually creating the right social conditions for change is, right. is the only way that change happens and that I mean that that's uh, that's built by you know real people engaging with each other in the real world and mm. organizing and applying political pressure through you know through civil society organizations that represent any any particular cause or set of interests so or really, whatever it might be you think that like being a a, represent, a representative it's it's something like having um sympathy for these social movements allowing them to or inviting them, empowering them with certain possibilities, but also seeing that that's a spontaneous kind of development of its own, that mm. the state doesn't really get to define um, what the people do. Well, we're supposed to be, as representatives, we're supposed to be responsive to the people, you know, the, the, the wants and the needs yeah. of the mm. people we represent. True. Your job. Yeah, exactly. And I, and I mean, uh, this is, oh, I've only got relatively small scale like local examples to refer to but um where i've seen um you know interest groups be most effective in influencing decision making it's been um it's been through that grassroots organizing and where i've not done any more than help coordinate and mm. direct the efforts of people who are already engaged on an issue and are really interested in putting their weight behind it yeah, yeah. it's you know you can't um you can't Confect, uh, you know, or, or kind of manufacture political engagement. That's so true. You really, you know, it needs to be there. And I think, I think this is where people's disinterest in politics, their disillusionment with politics, is really the major kind of barrier. Like yeah, that's is. that's the roadblock is that people um, routinely see decisions that are made um, without out their of political sen- self interest yeah. rather than broader social interest and social concerns true. or. Um, you know, reactive, fear-driven, culture war type, you know... Division stuff. Yeah, that's right. So, so I, I, you know, and as well as that, I think, you know, this is starting to get really meta, but we're at, we're at a point now where I think people are, you know, growing inequality means that people are struggling more and more to just meet their basic needs. Mm. Um, you know, we've, we've barely seen this increase in, you know... Um, in new start payments and social security yeah. support for, for decades now, um, which is inevitably going to have the effect of making life harder for a yeah. bunch of people. Um, and, and so like these trends where we've seen for decades now, um, disposable income has, has, has grown and now that's, that's peaked and it's tapering off. Mm-hmm. So the, all these indicators suggest that, um, that people are going to be much more concerned about meeting their immediate needs than with right. higher order political issues right. floating around yeah. them. And if, you know, kind of applying that to an issue like drug decriminalisation, if, you know, the black market exists, you can kind of get on with your daily life and just kind of put it to the side, ignore it, and True. not push for political change, then the reality that's is the path of least resistance and people will take us, it. Being, it being legal or not actually doesn't impact us, like, really. Um, we have to now be a little more discreet with everything we do and all of that, but we can get it. Like that's the thing. It, it's not like it doesn't like anything stopped. It's it's. I can pick up my phone, message five people, and I'll find a way to get something. Um, and that's probably the funniest thing about prohibition is like you think that's going to stop 
people. But it yep. really hasn't, especially with social media, it's changed the game. Mm. We talked to like an older mate and like, could you imagine like 30 years ago you were trying to um, get some cannabis? How would you get it? Like, you can't just shoot a text. You'd have to, you know, maybe call them on a landline and then be like, oh, do you want to meet me here? And then you're waiting. Like, there's no, you had no form of communication. You really had to know someone. Mm. Now, we instantly can find people. Like, we can, there are apps to find people. There and I think that's part apps. of why you have a broader push to legalize as well, is that you become ever more connected as a community. Mm. Um, just one of the things that, I don't know, like, really came up when you were saying that earlier is, I mean, there's this structure of party politics, which kind of bothers me in the sense that even if your party is like radically democratic internally, mm. you still have this sectioning off between, um, and I, I think the Greens is better at connecting and, and going outside of its internal circles to mm. engage with social movements and to engage with the grassroots. I think you guys are better at that than most any other party. But I still think there's a really um, limiting structure there um, because even a lot of the, I don't know, public consultation that occurs within the Greens and the uh, kind of like, I don't know what we, you would call it, like dialogue driven kind of consensus based policy approaches. Mm. I really like that stuff, but I don't think it's broad enough. It's not reaching a broad enough cross section of society yet. Mm. Um, it's not like a citizen led movement. Mm. And that's what I want. <laughs> yeah. Um, I like the Greens. I agree with them, but I don't really care about the old politics. I mm. would like to see people brought into the political process. Mm. And a lot of people just don't want to join the Greens or don't want to get involved with the Greens. Mm. And that bothers me. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think equally a lot of people just don't want to get involved in, in politics, politics generally. Also. Yeah. And but, look, you know, that's a, funny. It's what like, made that happen? Well, I, I think it's actually the dissociation of politics, because I think that politics is human relationships. I don't think it has anything more or less to do with anything else. Mm. It's, it's the power, it's the dynamics of what we do every day. Um, politics has become statecraft. Politics has become parliament, mm. or at least in the eyes of many it has. And we're taught that that's where it occurs that it's not actually something that we do every day mm -hmm. and that impacts our lives fundamentally. Yeah, the idea I, the idea that, you know, democracy happens in Queensland once every three years or oh. now it'll be every four years is, is one of the most damaging ideas that people that people have. I mean, as you say, democracy democracy is something that plays out daily. Yeah. Um, yeah. And, and, you know, that sort of disengagement that people have, what you know, what's driving it, I, you know, I'm sure there are bunch of different perspectives on this but I think our, our, our general kind of um, you know the increasing isolation that people have you know communities yeah. don't don't exist in the same yeah. way that they have done historically and you know the um, you know the, the I guess this is maybe maybe just part of a longer fallout of the you know the nuclear family and sure um, and especially now with so much of our our lives and our I was going to say social lives, but I don't think that's quite apt. But mm -hmm. you know, going on in social media and digital platforms, it's forum. simulated kind of social interaction. Yeah. yeah, yeah, and there's a there's a you know there's a lot of potential and you know power and possibilities in that. But yeah. it's also you know it it just kind of puts us further down this trajectory towards isolation and yeah, yeah. Um, and kind of dissociation from the actual community and the funny us. thing is like I, I look at people all of the time right and i go wow you're amazing you've been up to all of these things you have life experiences that inform everything that you are um and yet there are some aspects of you that just aren't present but they're present in this other person mm -hmm. like we are highly fragmented as a society and we are all into different things and we are empowered to do that because of information technology, because of ta capitalism, basically, which encourages us to specialize and do that. So there's this element of, I don't know, like coming across people who have little bits of the truth, little bits of the world and of reality that if we were all able to integrate together, if we were all able to listen to each other and actually connect to one another, we would be so much more intelligent, so much better off for it. And like kind of even that old indigenous knowledge, I think is a connection to nature and to other people that is very similar. Mm. You know, it's that aspect of being able to understand that 
you and your self-image isn't as narrow and as stubborn as you think it is, mm. that actually everything else that you think isn't you is part of the picture as well. Yeah. I think, I don't know. yeah, like, I guess, I mean, yeah, gra- uh, better decisions happen, better governance and um, social organisation happens when more people are involved, right? That's and that's right. the fundamental benefit of, of really robust grassroots democracy. Mm. It's just, it's hard to do. It is yeah, hard right? to do. Like, like consensus decision making is, is so hard right. to do as opposed to just, you know, taking a show of hands in any yeah. room where you're making Let decisions. Let alone actually, like, because I think you can make consensus decisions within... A, a proportion or a section of the population like um, XR Extinction Rebellion can make its decisions consensually within certain contexts mm. but that's um, within a, a certain frame within a certain population or demographic um, to get society wide consensus is a mm. whole other thing mm. you know? but I did have yeah. something I wanted to throw in here <clears throat> we're talking about um, what can people do and we talked about like you know you're on the online and you built a community there and that's where kind of people are thriving last year I built something um, that was my answer to trying to get a digital voice to become a little more physical to get people to actually take action mm. I built a platform called better letters and what it is is I've made it possible to send physical letters to your MP mm-hmm. on a mail merge through yeah. the click of a button mm-hmm. So we send it for you on your behalf. You select the MPs that you want to send it to, and you have we had pre-written letters, but you could write your own, and it's a dear first name, last name sort of situation. Mm. And I was wondering, what would happen if by chance there was half a million letters sent to a couple MPs in the federal house, and, um, house, parliament, senate, whatever, wherever it goes, regarding a particular issue, would it make a difference? Um, uh, look, yes and no. I mean, there's different ways to come at this right and mm. and I think there's uh, the, the the truth of being an elected rep is that if you on any given day you know whether it's a hard copy letter or an email well, if you get if you get deleted. yeah well they can and, and I mean and, and, and is, a letter can be you know shredded or just chucked in the bin but, but, there's, but a there's a there's there is something um, you know that's that's different about receiving it you know yeah. snail mail True. Um, but at the same time I think the, the point I was going to make is that it doesn't take more than you know a dozen emails or, or snail mail bits of correspondence on an issue to make it the biggest issue in your office in a day. Oh, yeah. mm-hmm. So, so yeah, there's there's definitely scope for you know for us as you know citizens, participants in democracy to you know to make ourselves known to elected reps yeah, and to true. to apply pressure in that way. Because um, to me, an email doesn't seem like pressure. I can skim over emails very easily. Like. I could imagine most, uh, like, how many emails a day do you get to the office? Stacks. Um, the, I would make much more of a distinction, not between snail mail and email, mm-hmm. but instead between um, personalised correspondence and, you know, mass-produced, yeah. you know. So, yes, with emails, we get plenty of these, you know, you just Copy put in your case. postcode, yeah, click the button and, and off it goes. There's form emails. Um, and they're a, they're a useful way of getting a sense of, you know how big an issue is in in some respects, but but if if I as a you know as a rep if I get you know ten emails from ten separate constituents that approach an issue in a slightly different way, conveying mm. their particular concerns, perspective, um, that's really powerful. Super valuable. Yeah. So so I think um, yeah that kind of you know mass correspondence can be a powerful tool to you know to raise an issue in you know in the mind of of any elected rep because let's face it everyone's you know doing their darndest to get re-elected and that's yeah. that's why so many of these issues are, are unceremoniously pushed yeah. to the side mm. more often than not because re-election is the key priority for you know for most mps or other yeah, other elected it's a bit reps. Grim, that. It, yeah it is it it's, is it really shouldn't be that way i really think um it'd be interesting to see if uh say you just completely removed payment from politicians, what that would do, mm. right? Like, who's going to be interested then? Like, there's a big incentive for the payments to come through because you'll be making money from it. So the re-election shouldn't matter as much because if you're not making money, why do you want to get re-elected mm. for a lot of people? And I think that's kind of maybe where a bit of a trap has fallen into. You're meant to be a public servant. Yeah. A servant, well, I mean, how much do you get paid as a servant, like, in general? Um, yeah. 
that it's just one of those things that I kind of think about as where has it all gone wrong a little bit. Yeah, and I mean, it's a fair, it's a fair question, and I can understand. I mean, particularly given you the performance we see from a lot of how you live. <laughs> yeah, that's right. I mean, you don't, you can't, you, you know. That's everyone removing has to payments be. a fast track to that might know, be turning parliament into a you know PNC committee or something like yeah, that. Yeah. But you know, not to be disparaging of all the hard work of PNC <laughs> committees and associations <laughs> and around the country. Yeah, but look, volunteer. Like, I what, guess this is the what thing. if it wasn't as high pay? You know, like what if it was just a standard living wage? That would be more interesting. To yeah, me. and look, there are some really interesting ideas thrown around about how you how you tie, um, you know, politician salaries to yeah to the median median wage and, mm. and what does that do for you know your incentives to be a representative but I guess I you know there's no doubt that um, that you know this can be a really hard job and um, yeah for sure and I guess you know that balance between creating an incentive for people to do the job well you know um, also recognizing that you want people to have incentives that aren't financial yeah um, yeah it's a it's a tough tough balance and a tough conversation to have in public for most you know, politicians. Do you think it would be a good start maybe to, you know, reform campaign financing, stuff like that? Oh, for sure, yeah. And look, that, that's, we've had, that's actually, you know, talking about what a, you know, how to make political change, what a win looks like. We've, mm. we've seen um, quite recently when a few months back, end of last year or maybe mid last year, no, it was quite late in the year, the government's introduced this. Um, this proposal for reform of electoral spending and donations, to, so to finally cap donations across the board. That's now, great. But there was like a cap. I, I could be wrong. Um, there was a cap, but you could do it. You could be below the cap and just donate every day. Wasn't that a thing? Um, no, not as far as I know. The, what's proposed is a um, is a cap that kind of spans the the electoral cycle. Okay, so yeah. you know, in effect, a, a maximum of um, four thousand dollars per you know, per four year term, yeah. um, which we think is a sensible cap. It's, you know, there, there's plenty of detail in there that we still need to drill down into because what, what that does almost by default is, um, uh, because there are spending caps proposed as well, which is, I think, really important, but for non, non you know, um, for third parties other than political parties. So that means, you know, NGOs or yeah, right. uh, corporate bodies, peak bodies, whatever it might be. Um, they can still spend up to um, up to a million bucks each election, mm. which you know that's not pocket change. You can do a lot of advertising and campaigning potentially for that. It's not exactly Clive Palmer's sixty or eighty million dollars that he spent on the federal election, yeah, either, but it's not was. it's not insubstantial. Love that he didn't get one seat. Yeah, no. yeah, that's right. Well, that apparently wasn't his objective. He said yeah, I agree. Okay. So whether 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 that's his um, you know after the fact justification for blowing 80 million bucks who knows but, but um yeah the, i mean the reform's good largely i do still have some concerns about whether it just means that those big corporate interests that you know that make a shitload of money and you know for whom a million bucks is not a huge sum of money then they might still have a potentially disproportionate mm -hmm. influence on you know on, on elections and um but especially big, people big like the mining direction. council and stuff I mean, yeah, and look, I mean, they're an deal. interesting one as a peak body because they obviously can take donations to perform that function, but they also take substantial membership fees. Yeah, and how exactly. the legislation yeah. deals with those different categories of funding and financing is, um, you know, devil's in the detail. But huh. um, yeah, big, big step in the right direction. It'd be really interesting to see what final form this legislation takes. But it's a brilliant example of, you know, Green's policy and the presence of a single MP in there, I think having a, a you know, an oversized influence on what it is, you know, government's willing to do. Mm. And you definitely see that not just in Queensland government, but also Brisbane City Council, mm. you see it in federal, you see it in many yeah. different places across Australia. And I think that it's, um, it's taken time for, you know, the Greens as a parliamentary movement, as a social movement to establish themselves in that way. Yeah. It's almost like taking it to the next step with with these upcoming elections. Yeah. Um, I guess one of the big questions I wanted to ask before we, we finished up yeah. was, uh, you know, what are the areas that the Greens are kind of looking at in Queensland at the moment and eyeing, eyeing out? What, what areas in the, in the parliamentary space would you really like to take over 
as a as an electoral party. Oh, as in, so you mean what what issues? Where are your strong, can- where are your strong candidates? Yeah, who do you want to see in oh, in Parliament? Look, um, so we can support them. And anyone? I need some friends in there. Um, <laughs> look, we. Must be lonely. Yeah, it's a it's a challenging job to do as the sole representative of of a party. Like, you know, there's there's obviously. Uh, an enormous amount of my focus needs to go on representing the people who elected me because that's that's yeah. the job. But on on the other hand, I'm you know one percent of the MPs in there representing ten percent of the state that voted green in yeah. the last state election. So that's that weighs heavily on me as a you know a very real responsibility to to state politics more broadly. So mm. so yeah, it's challenging. Look, um, we've we've got some really exciting prospects coming up at this next election, right? We've we've got. Uh, I don't know exactly how many seats that have a primary vote very similar to or well above where the primary vote notionally was in Maywa at the last election. Wow. So, you know, and we've also, I guess, got, um, you know, if people are interested in helping the party and, you know, helping us grow and in- increase our, our influence and our scope to, you know, to, to push for sensible policy like decriminalisation and all sorts of other um, important issues, you know, I guess the 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 way to do that is to get involved with the party and to get you know get on the ground, you sure. know, field campaigning, getting out and door knocking and having conversations. You guys with do a lot of that. Yeah, and it's it's the most powerful way to kind of just break straight through that kind of malaise and the isolation and the yeah. disconnection that that's kind of you know it's the main barrier to people having a say and influencing politics and policy and and even just. Even just understanding what it is that you know that we hope to represent in politics. Um, right. So yeah, that's um, you know I think yeah um, it would be foolhardy of me to name names. Um, <laughs> and right. I think I think we've got uh, we've got potential to have a really you know breakthrough in a big way in this next yeah. state campaign. Um, I see the potential for that too, mm. and I also think. Um, I mean, the council elections coming up soon. I think that I could go the same way. Yeah, and look, that we're we're seeing, you know, in in this campaign that's already on foot for the local government elections, there is a real movement growing, and that will flow straight into mm. the state campaign. When is it? Uh, it's Halloween. Halloween. Wow. 31st of October this year. We're dressing up. Yeah, when all the bills come out. Um, oh, it's going to be horror for some others. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, look, it's an exciting year for, um, you know, for, I, I don't think for, even for us just as a political party, but for, you know, for the progressive movement. Agree. Um, well, to, yeah, to really... the US election, that's the big one. Mm. Like that yeah, it's big, fascinating big, big seeing big that play out. Because that could play out to the rest of the world. Mm. So, yeah, that'll be interesting. Yeah, it will be. Absolutely. The way these dynamics are evolving, it's it's fun to like think about it as if you were on the sidelines, but we are actually living it. It's yeah, really funny. yeah, that's right. Um, yeah. Anyway, no, it's not a spectator sport. No. No, 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 and a lot of people seem to have, um, you know, a vested interest in it because of their experiences. Like, if you've gone through some shit, then of course you're going to care, kind mm. of thing. So yeah, that's it's, right. It's cool to see people getting involved in that way. Yeah. Um, Thanks, Michael, for having us. Thank you. Yeah, it's a pleasure. Yeah, thanks for thanks for having me on air or at least sitting in the room with me. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you very much. Cheers. Bye. Bye, audience. Bye. Bye.